in literature and in art, there's often tales of a person selling his soul to the devil uh, for one of the three or all the three Ps, pleasure, possessions, and power. And of course, at the end of the story, the person realizes that they got the raw end of the deal because nothing is as precious as the soul that defines who we are as creatures of God and who will stand before the throne of God forever. But our culture as a whole promotes not the pursuit of happiness, but the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of possessions, the pursuit of power, as if the pursuit of those things were equivalent to the pursuit of happiness. And people that pursue any one or all three of those uh, elements in their life find that in the end they create hell on earth for themselves and those around them and they've lost the sense of their own soulfulness, their own sacred nature. Now, on the other hand, if we pursue the will of God, yes, we will have a lot of pleasure in our lives and we'll have enough possessions, food, shelter, and clothing to take care of our needs. And we'll find a liberation that comes from not seeking power, but the liberation that comes from serving others before we serve ourselves. Now the whole history of salvation goes against the history of the world, where power, prestige, influence, pleasure, these things are extolled as at the heart of what's important in life. But in our first reading today, we have from Isaiah. Hundreds of years before Christ, he gets this crazy idea coming into his head that humanity would be reconciled with God. Divinity and the human would come together in a suffering servant who would be totally crushed. And in that action would somehow lift up a humanity that has been racked and weighed down with guilt and sin. And that somehow through that suffering servant a light would shine in the darkness. How could he ever come up with that on his own? Well, the answer he, is he couldn't. It came from the heart of God, revealing God's plan for the salvation of humanity. Now, in today's second reading, we have the author of Hebrews saying, we have a high priest, the one that's reconciling the divine and the human that could sympathize with us because he was one of us. He walked in our shoes. He had a human body, human emotions, human soul, uh, and he understood human rejection, human betrayal. He understood what it was like for people to gossip about him, to malign him, to call him a devil. He understood that his closest disciples couldn't get a handle on who he was and what he was calling them to be. He there went hunger and thirst and finally a horrible death on the cross fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. Now in our own journeys, we find that there are times when we're healthy enough, strong enough and have enough possessions to share them with others and to be instruments of grace in the midst of this world. That in the Gospel of Matthew, the last public sermon of Jesus, in the separation of the sheep and the goats, those that visit the sick and the imprisoned, that clothe the naked, feed the hungry, they'll be considered part of the kingdom of God. But then there comes times when we are physically broken, emotionally distraught, times when we're financially bankrupt or on the brink of bankruptcy, and we need help from others. At which point we unite our suffering with the suffering of the suffering servant of Christ. 
And we become an instrument of grace in this world in a different way, where we allow others to have that grace to aid us, to encourage us, to assist us, and in the process find themselves being defined amongst the sheep of the, wo the world at the final judgment. And when we're the suffering person, and we can't do anything for others, that's precisely the time we can be the closest we can be to the suffering servant, Christ himself. Now, the cultures of the world see no meaning in suffering, no purpose in suffering, no significance to suffering. It should be fled at all costs, take drugs or alcohol to cover it up. Now, it's true, medicinally, we should cut a person's individual suffering, make them as, most, as comfortable as possible through medicine. But the mentality that suffering has no place in this world leads to the murderous idea of, well, we can't really cure this disease, so let's kill this patient. Isn't that the humane thing to do? Not at all. It's the inhumane thing to do because it's not the divine thing to do. And that's where we find what our humanity is all about. The culture is to take care of the weak, the widow, the poor, the, the stranger in our midst. And this is part of our call as part of that culture. Now in today's gospel passage, we see that the disciples of Jesus themselves had been seduced by the thought of power. All right, they'd been having a tough go of it. They had to leave a lot of possessions behind, their fishing boats, their business, their, their tax collector's post. They made that commitment. And things had not been all that pleasant. Every now and then they'd have a nice dinner with the publicans and sinners. Uh, but on the whole, it was getting a bit rough. So they were learning the virtue of fortitude and courage. But now the idea was coming, we know we're on the brink of a new kingdom. The kingdom to come is right in our midst. And here's this miracle working, loving, extraordinary rabbi that we're given up everything to follow. And boy, when that kingdom comes, we're going to have really good jobs. <laughs> and so James and John, they sort of try to con Jesus. They don't want to spring it on them all at once. You know, so they say, uh, Lord, we want you to do whatever we're going to ask you. And he said, oh, what would that be? Well, when you come into your kingdom, we want to be on your right and left-hand side, the best places. You know? And this is the seduction of power. The seduction of power. And he said, could you drink of the cup I'm about to drink? They said, sure. But he wasn't talking about the chalice, the cup, even the cup of the Last Supper. He was talking about the cup of grief, of sorrow, of suffering. That cup that would be offered to him in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. That cup that he would accept on the cross of Calvary, a mixture of gall and myrrh in the midst of his suffering. And he said, Can we be, could you be baptized in the same baptism I'm about to be baptized in? He said, oh, sure. Thinking it was the baptism of John, baptism of water rather than that baptism of grief and sorrow on Calvary. He said, well, you're going to do both of those things. And both of them would end up martyrs. But who's the greatest in the kingdom? You're on the wrong track. He said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, forget about power, prestige, and influence. Seek the lowest spot. Become a servant of others. Then, much to your amazement, you'll find what true greatness is all about. Now, our world and the world in every individual culture can't quite get a handle on that approach to life. And yet, we who have been given the gift of faith, if we contemplate it, we make it a part of the fabric of our imaginations, our very souls, we'll know what it is means to be a man. We'll know what it means to be a woman. We'll know what it means to be a child of God. And not, no pleasure, no power, no possessions 
can replace that understanding. In other words, nothing could be more important than our soul and our soulfulness. Now, the only way to nourish that type of attitude in ourselves is to put ourselves in the presence and mercy of God over and over again in prayer, praying the Our Father, praying the Hail Mary, praying the glory be to the Father, coming to the Eucharist as sinners in need of repentance and salvation, and going away refreshed, building up the virtues, not only of faith and of hope, but also of charity and love, and learning how to be courageous in the midst of a cowardly world, getting a real sense of justice, what's right and wrong, and working for that, becoming wise rather than foolish in the midst of a world that promotes foolishness, and having a temperate spirit that keeps us from being knocked off kilter. We could do all these things not by ourselves, but by the power of God in Christ and the spirit that he has sent upon his church.